up on the beach. It's like a fish out of water. It seems no different than all the other varieties that grow along the shores of the California coast. Maybe it's a little better for skipping rope and decorating sandcastles. But cast away here on the beach to dry in the sun, the giant kelp ends up a lifeless nuisance. But if people could visit the incredible forest under the sea where it grows, they would see vegetation as lush as anything on land like forest of redwood, pine, or oak, a haven for animal life, and a natural resource invaluable to man. My job takes me deep into those forests under the sea, and I see the giant kelp like no one on land ever can. I spent almost 40 years working out there, harvesting the giant kelp beds. And even today I realize that the value of the giant kelp plant is a mystery to most people. Among all the kinds of seaweed growing along our shores, giant kelp is the most remarkable. You see, since the 1880s, men knew that this brown seaweed contained an interesting substance called algin. But little was done with algin until the early 30s. Back then, about the only thing algin was used for was to make a can sealing compound. But now, well, hardly a day goes by that we don't come into contact with something that contains or has used algin. Now take foods, salad dressing, barbecue sauce, ice cream, toppings, puddings, milkshake mixes, juice drinks. Frozen, prepared, and canned foods of all kinds all use algin. All these foods are either thicker, better mixed, or have a smoother texture because they contain algae. I mean, they pour better, they stay creamier, stay mixed longer, and they look better. The amazing thing about algae is that it's an exceptional suspending, thickening, and stabilizing agent. Now, a good example is Italian dressing. You see, the ingredients in the dressing without algae quickly separate out. Spread thin on a sheet of glass, algin forms a soluble film. It is this property that allows algin to help form a fine coating on paper and paperboard products. Another kind of algin helps hold a rich, foamy head on a glass of beer. And food uses are only part of the story. Just take a look around. Paper, paint, wallpaper paste, textiles, adhesives welding rod coatings, printed textiles, patching plaster, car polish, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics. They all use algin for much the same reason it is used in foods. It helps suspend, stabilize, or thicken ingredients in water-based solutions. There's the harvester I used to skipper coming into port must have close to 500 tons of kelp on board. From that kelp right there, they'll get around 25,000 pounds of algin. <laughs> That's enough to stabilize a 
two million gallon milkshake. The kelp is brought from up and down the California coast to the processing plant in San Diego. It's chopped, leached, filtered, sterilized, mixed with other ingredients, and sent through a maze of pipes. Heated, treated, strained, and dried, all just to produce that algae. flowing powders are algin derivatives or alginates. When alginates started being used in all sorts of products, we engineered harvesters that were like big sea-going lawnmowers. Large cutting racks work through the kelp canopy, drawing the kelp strands up into the bin. Now they cut it only three to four feet below the surface, just like mowing a lawn. That kelp canopy grows right back again within a few weeks. Years ago, many of the kelp beds off Southern California dwindled dangerously close to extinction. The Pacific had cycled into a period of warmer water, and kelp cannot survive in water above 70 degrees. In proper conditions, kelp forests grow to be large and dense, but they are surprisingly vulnerable and easily destroyed by changes in the environment. Kelp does not have the sturdy roots of a land plant. Instead, a clump of branching strands called a holdfast clings to the rocky ocean floor. Since it has no roots, kelp must absorb nutrients from the water through the surface of its blades. It thrives where strong currents constantly bring in a new supply of nutrients. Like forest on land, the giant kelp must have sunlight to grow. So little gas-filled bulbs buoy up the long blades along the length of the plant. After four or five months of good growth, kelp plants will have climbed 70 feet toward the sun. They provide vital food and shelter for many kinds and sizes of marine life, from microscopic plankton to the largest whale.
years ago, before we were harvesting, big drifts of old kelp would be broken off by storms and pile up on shore, sometimes as high as eight to ten feet. Well, today the problem isn't nearly as great, and a great part of the reason is regular harvesting. You see, harvesting actually promotes growth in the kelp beds. If that top layer, it's what we call the canopy, of the kelp bed isn't harvested, the old strands will just naturally die, drift away, and contribute to those smelly piles of beach litter. And another thing, regular harvesting of the canopy lets in more sunlight, and sunlight encourages growth of the younger plants in those lush forests out there. But I can remember when we were in real danger of losing many of the kelp beds along the Southern California coast. They all but disappeared off Los Angeles and Orange County. Our marine biologists had a real problem on their hands. Like any forest, kelp survives best when certain ecological factors are unbalanced. The water temperature must be cool, the bottom rocky, the marine life non-threatening, and the plants must have an ample supply of sunlight and currents to bring in a flow of nutrients. But as with so much of our environment, the delicate balance of nature in the kelp beds was disturbed. Upsetting the echo balance led to a voracious invasion by kelp's natural enemy, a spiny marine creature called a sea urchin. By the early 1950s, many kelp beds were a fraction of the size they were in the old days. Hordes of urchins had been moving through the beds like locusts through a wheat field. We found that they could devour 30 feet of bottom growth a month. Biting through the hole fast and free in the plant to float away with the currents and die on the beach, man had inadvertently contributed to the urchin population explosion. During the 19th and early 20th century, he had nearly hunted the sea otter into extinction. Sea urchins are a favorite food of the otters who use rocks as tools to break them open. Without the otters to feed on them, the urchins were left to multiply virtually unchecked. Then there was a the problem of sewage pumped from the cities out to sea. Sewage can cover the rocky ocean bottom with silt, preventing the growth of new plants, leaving nothing for the kelp's hold fast to cling to. The cloudy waters screen out life-giving sunlight. The result can be a devastated landscape. Fortunately, the marine scientists stepped in before it was too late for the kelp forest. By 1962, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, under a Kelco grant, began the Kelp Habitat Improvement Project, continued by California Institute of Technology. This project identified the role of the sea urchin in the deterioration of the beds. Through research, ways were found to control the sea urchins. <laughs> With the urchins brought back into balance, many sections of the beds grew back so rapidly that plants had to be thinned out or die. More studies helped to discover ways of transplanting healthy juvenile kelp plants into previously devastated areas. As for the sea otters, for many years now, they've been reintroduced to central California waters, protected, and their numbers are growing. <laughs> Kelp harvesting is conducted under the regulation of the California Department of Fish and Game and kelp forests, through responsible management and conservation measures, are beginning to near the generous boundaries occupied some 60 years ago. The kelp beds are thriving again, almost back to what they were when I first took the wheel of a harvest. And that means scientists can continue to develop new formulations using algin to solve specific consumer needs. These are constantly being tested, evaluated, and modified at laboratories in San Diego. 
At the same time, research is developing new substances which can control the flow properties of water. This understanding of water control led to the development of a completely new substance in the early 1960s. Called xanthan gum, it's a natural carbohydrate or polysaccharide produced by fermentation. Xanthan gum is manufactured in San Diego and now in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, at the two largest facilities of their kind in the world. The survival of the kelp beds depends on maintaining the balance of nature. Like the forests on land, it took years for man to understand that the kelp forests are not an unlimited natural resource and years to understand that the kelp forests need intelligent management if they are to continue as a resource. Change the ecological balance and the giant kelp are as easily destroyed as fire destroys a forest. And if the kelp is destroyed, so also is the marine life it supports. But fortunately, we learned one of nature's most basic lessons. If we want to go on enjoying the benefits of any natural resource, We'll have to protect it, conserve it, and help it to replenish. And if we can remember that, we can go on year after year harvesting the riches of the earth from land and from the sea.